Good morning. It's good to be back with you. I appreciate your prayers. As uh, I was away last week, uh, I had the opportunity to preach in a revival in North Carolina. Uh, a friend of mine that I met uh, at seminary uh, about a year ago invited me to come and, and preach there. I had an experience eating something that I've never even heard of, much less eaten. You know, you think like this doesn't happen unless you're in a foreign country like India or something like that, but I was sitting there Sunday morning, uh, about ready to eat breakfast before church started, and the guys were talking about, you know, things that they enjoy eating, and one of them said, have you ever had liver mush? Yeah, that's what I thought too. <laughs> no, I haven't. Oh man, that's the greatest thing in the world. You ain't living until you've eaten liver mush. I'm like, really? I mean, I'm thinking there's a lot of things. I, liver mush? What does it eat? What does it even look like? And I probably should not have indulged in curiosity because they're like, we're going to get you one. And so they send a lady to the local restaurant where they serve it. And what they do is it's, it's ground hog liver mixed with cornmeal and fried in a patty. And they serve it on a bun or on a, on a biscuit, like a sausage biscuit. Only instead of sausage, you get liver mush. And I ate it. And it was not great. Um, <laughs> now, if you like liver... You might like it, um, but I don't like liver. I knew that it was going to be bad going down, so I just kind of smiled and got her done. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. You go to different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and you experience different things. Um, I'm excited because uh, Michael, who's the pastor of Eichard Baptist Church there, is going to be here January 8th. He's coming through uh, to go to another seminar, and so I asked him to preach. I can't wait for you guys to meet him and to hear him preach God's Word. But uh, anyway, that, that's enough of that. Today is a different day. Today is uh, not a, a typical sermon. It's not really a sermon at all. It's, it's more of an address. And every year, you know, we, we spend time reflecting on where we've been over the last year and where we're headed into the next year. So this is our State of the Church address uh, for 2016. And so I just want you to open your Bibles to Matthew 28. I want us to orient what we're about to talk about in our purpose and our mission. What is that, that God has called us and commissioned us to do? What is it that is our purpose? Now we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31 that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything we do is intended to magnify the greatness of God, to display the, the wonder and the grace and the majesty of God. Everything is to draw attention to God who is worthy of worship. Now the one thing that we as a body of believers are called to do to magnify Him the most is this, what Jesus commands us in Matthew 28, verse 18. When Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It makes you think of Daniel, doesn't it? Uh, everything we've been reading through Daniel, Christ is the one like a son of man to whom dominion, glory, and splendor have been given to Him. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We are called, we are commissioned, we are commanded to bring all of creation, all of humanity under allegiance to Christ. Jesus is worthy of their devotion. Jesus is worthy of their worship. Jesus is the King of the universe. It is His way and His will that triumphs. And it's our responsibility to lovingly and faithfully tell that good news to the nations. You see, we live in the midst of a culture that is pluralistic. And you know, just this last week I was talking to a, a, a young lady and she was telling me that she had once been involved in Christianity, but she'd left that now. She was more interested in Buddhism and Hinduism, and, but really she was kind of an agnostic, as if this is just a, a religious buffet that you pick and choose what interests you and what fascinates you, and you involve yourself in that. And she had no, real, no realization that, that it is one God who saves and it is the one God who has manifested himself in the Lord Jesus Christ through his resurrection, proving that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no salvation in any other name but in his. And we must tell that good news to the nations. And that's why we exist as a church. We exist to make disciples. We make disciples as we go through life. 
as you walk into the grocery store, as you check out at Walmart, as you, as you talk with your neighbors, as you go on mission trips, as you go on disaster relief trips, as you go to work and as you spend time with family, you are making disciples as you go, as you live life. All of us are commanded to do that. We make disciples by helping people to come to that point where they publicly identify themselves with Christ. I want to follow Christ. I deny myself. I take up my cross. I follow after Christ. And they profess that publicly through baptism. We want to teach people to do everything that Jesus commanded, to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Because being a disciple is not just someone who makes a commitment to follow Christ, and then they go and live however they want. To follow Christ means to follow Christ. It means to obey Christ. But we can't obey Christ if we don't know what Christ has commanded. And so we must teach in the making of disciples. So though this, this philosophy, this theology, this thinking is what has shaped our mission as Macon First Baptist Church. It's why we do what we do. It's everything we do is geared toward this end. About three years ago, in 2013, we established some 10-year goals. In 10 years, we want, to, we want to try and obtain these objectives. If we aim at nothing, we hit nothing every time. But if we aim at something, we may not hit our target bullseye, but we're going to be further along than if we just coasted through Christianity, if we just coasted by as a church, not really trying to accomplish anything. So I just want us to think about these goals for a few moments and then talk about the strategy we are developing this year to continue moving us toward the accomplishment of those goals. The first goal was that we would see an average attendance in worship of 1,500 people. Now that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. It's not impossible. There's 5,000 people that live within Macon itself. That's not just counting the people that live outside the city limits of Macon. Not counting the people that would come from Moberly or Brookfield or, or uh, some as far away as Novelty. We have people that are coming a long way. So we have a large group of people. And there's a lot of them. They don't go to church anywhere. They're uninterested in the Lord. They're uninterested in the things of God. They don't realize they're perishing. And it's our responsibility to tell them the gospel. And if we are faithful to tell them the gospel, we're faithful to pray, we're going to see people saved and we're going to see... The, the numbers increase. We're not in this for the numbers. We're in this for the souls. We want to make disciples. And so we aim at this goal in order to kind of help us keep committed to that work. Now this year we averaged 385 in attendance. That was our average attendance this year. We want to see more people attending because that means more people hearing the gospel more people being invited to church and one of the strategies this past year was we set up online a way to track if you invited someone to church if you had a gospel conversation with someone we just wanted to measure that not for the purpose of bragging but for the purpose of accountability we wanted to have that accountability yes we as a church are intentionally striving to invite people to church to tell the gospel to people who haven't heard about christ and a lot of people were kind of uncomfortable with that. Many of you told me, Pastor, I'm, I'm telling the gospel and I'm inviting people to church, but I'm not going to go online and report it. And so we're not doing that again this year. We did have 177 people invited to church that were reported. We had 39 gospel conversations that were reported. And I know many of you did more than that because you told me so, but we just didn't report it. I want you to continue being faithful to that. People will come if you invite them. If you invite them, they will come. The statistics tell us this, that many people just don't come to church because no one's invited them. They don't think that anyone cares. And so if we would just invite them, they will come. Now something to praise the Lord about is this year 22 people were added to our church family, 13 of which were baptized into the faith. Isn't that glorious? Amen. It is wonderful that God is saving people and we want to see God continue saving people. We want to see more people like the Bentleys coming and, uh, and committing themselves to being members of the church. We recognize membership as significant. It is, a, it is a moment in which you commit to this body. For better or worse, we're going to strive together. We're going to hold one another accountable. We're going to be there to love and pray for one another. We are committed to one another. That's what membership is all about, and so we want to continue pushing that forward. I have hopes that by this time next year, our average attendance will have grown to around 450. That's my hope. That's my prayer as we move towards that number of 1,500. A second goal is we want to see 
in foundations in Sunday school, a thousand people every week. Now, again, it's a really big number, but when you think about the number of lost people in this city that are not even going to church right now, have no interest in God at all, that number is small. That number is small. And we need to be working harder to reach them with the gospel. And so I want to encourage, this year we had an average of 253 people attending foundations and Sunday school. That means on average, 132 of you are just showing up for worship. Now, showing up for worship is good. But if you want to grow in your faith, if you want... Do you, do you struggle with sin? Anybody? Anybody struggle with sin? I struggle with sin. We struggle with reoccurring sin, and it's frustrating. It's demoralizing. Do you know the, the only way that you conquer sin in your life, especially sin that seems to have your number, the only way you conquer it is by loving Jesus more than you love that sin. It's the only way. You will not do it. You will not overcome that sin in any other way than to love Jesus more than you love that sin. And the only way you're going to love Jesus more than you love that sin is to know Jesus. The more you know Jesus, the more you love Jesus. It's that simple. This is why we've created Sunday School. It's why we've created Foundations, because we want to increase your knowledge of God, because we are convinced the more you realize who God is and what God has done, you will be amazed at Him and you will love Him. And the more you love Him, the more you will hate your sin. And that's how we want to grow, and that's how we want to minister. So if you really want to, to overcome sin and you want to... To, to move and grow as a Christian, you've got to make it a point to be a part of foundations in Sunday school. And you say, well, pastor, it's just kind of boring sometimes. Sometimes it is. Sometimes sermons are boring too. Hopefully, there's fewer boring ones than non-boring ones. But, but you come because you know this is important. You eat your green beans and your spinach and tomatoes and... Why? Because you know they're good for you. You force your children to eat those things because you know they're good for you. We do things, we go to the doctor, we go to the dentist. Why? Because we know it's good for us. It's helpful. And that's not always pleasant. Sometimes it's not bad. Sometimes it's more difficult than others. But we go because we know it's good for us. It's healthy. It strengthens us. The same is true of Foundations and Sunday School. You need to be hearing and learning what you believe and why you believe it. So that's one of our goals. So we're moving in the right direction. We want to see more of you committed. I would love to see our number, our average attendance in worship and our average attendance in Sunday school being the same because everyone is committed to that work. Our third goal is to have 100 fully functioning home groups. 100 fully functioning home groups with an average of about 10 people per group. This year, we have 17 functioning home groups. My, my hope was to have 20 by this year. So we're only three off, and that's fantastic. And there's an average of 164 people attending home groups every week, which means there's 221 of you that are not yet connected to a home group. Now, home groups, why are home groups significant? Because you need community. You need relational bonding with other believers, you need to be able to have the comfort to talk about life, to talk about what's going on in your life, the freedom to ask for prayer, the freedom to, to ask someone to help you in a particular area. But if, if we're just a bunch of people gathering together as a, as a large crowd and we're just numbers in the crowd, we're not going to have that sense of community. We're not going to have that prayer for one another, that accountability. Home groups are designed to provide that. And we want to encourage all of you to become part of a home group. If you're not connected to a home group, you, haven't, you don't have to wait until August when we start them again. You can join now. And as we grow, home groups will multiply. So one group will become two groups. It may, maybe it'll take all year. Maybe it'll take just a few months as the numbers of that group grow. But we want to constantly be adding people to the groups so that everyone is experiencing this relational joy and growth. You need that in your Christianity. It will help you grow. You know what's exciting to me is this year we have our first uh, student home group. Student-led, student participants, and it was their idea, which to me is exciting. Uh, I think that's wonderful, and I, and I hope that we continue to see that continuing to grow. Our fourth goal was to establish a working mission partnerships. Now, originally, the goal was stated that we would 
see a church planted among the Camorian people. Now, that, that, didn't, that partnership didn't really work out like we thought it was going to. God, I think God had other plans for us. What we have seen, though, is that God has uh, helped us to establish two partnerships. Pastor Sam has been working very hard uh, to establish these two partnerships, one with India and one with Uganda. We had seven individuals travel to India this year proclaiming the gospel, doing everything from teaching pastors and leaders so that they could go back and teach their people to preaching the gospel to villages that have never heard Christ's name before. That's glorious. Not only do we have seven individuals go for a short-term mission trip, but one of our members, Caleb Mosley, who was a, a student here, grew up here, went to Hannibal LaGrange, did a ministry degree there, is called to ministry. He has been in India working with our team for the last six months. He's been hiking in the mountains proclaiming the gospel to people who have never heard. He's been training pastors. He's been working hard. And that is phenomenal. This is a, a very strong partnership that we look forward to seeing what God's got in store for us. If you've never been on an international trip for missions, you need to go. It will change your life. And I have a desire to see more than just seven of us participating this next year. We also went to Uganda. And this partnership came about somewhat quickly, but... There's exciting things happening through SOS Ministries in Uganda. I was able to go and train pastors how to study and preach God's Word. Pastor Sam, Pastor Christian went and were able to preach to nearly a thousand students about the gospel and holiness that comes from living out the gospel. Uh, there is huge potential for construction mission trips, for medical mission trips, for education training mission trips. Uh, all in Uganda, which means there's more of us can go than just the four or five that is able to go to an India trip. And so it's exciting to see the potential for what God is going to do in these two partnerships. We already have a trip in the works for March going to India. I know that we're working on one towards Uganda as well. And so just encourage you to be a part of these ministries. A fifth goal was to establish a solid children's student discipleship program. And I'm excited because Pastor Christian has been doing a phenomenal job. He's taken on this ministry, uh, taking on children's ministry, taking the reins of children's ministry, and he is working very hard to streamline and work all of the details together so that we, that, that children come up, they grow up in the training and the study of Scripture all the way into student ministry, and there's not a, not a beat missed where they keep growing. They learn theology. They learn worldview. They learn all of these things. He launched Kids Cove Worship again, as you saw all the kids go out. It's going very, very well. Uh, the thing I'm excited about is he started a notebook system with the students. And so every week the students come into crossover and they get their notebook and they write down uh, answers to questions that he has posed to them or they have a chance to write down questions they have and he interacts with every student through those notebooks. He's able to answer their questions, he's able to pray for them and they can be honest with him because it's all confidential. He's the only one that sees that and so he's regularly caring for their souls, helping them to grow, answering their questions. I think it's phenomenal and I'm very thankful for him. Our, our, and so this goal is a long way towards being done. I mean, it's, it's just a, a good system. We're still working out bugs and kinks as we do with everything, but it's moving in a great direction. The next goal was to establish a solid discipleship program for adults. And this is what Foundations is. Foundations is designed to train you in theology, to train you in, so that you know what you believe and why you believe it, to train you in how to study your Bible, to train you in prayer, to train you in sharing your faith, to, to teach you what a biblical worldview looks like so that your faith can interact with the culture. All of that stuff is immensely important. I would encourage you to get involved in foundations. If you're not involved in foundations, you're missing a key component um, to your life. And so I would encourage you to get involved there. We've also established personal discipleship plans. Now currently we've only got six individuals taking advantage of that. Now we've had some uh, kinks in the program. We wanted to, we've worked that out. We're trying to be more intentional in contacting our people, encouraging our people uh, to keep moving forward. But I want to see more of you take advantage of that. You come in, you sit down for an interview with one of our pastors, you share where, where you're at spiritually, and they will use that to help you start from where you're at and move gradually forward, taking baby steps so that you continue to grow and you begin to, to take ownership of your faith. And you're not just a Christian because you go to church, but you're actively seeking the Lord. Take advantage of that opportunity. It's like a personal fitness plan. 
You meet with a trainer, he trains you, he teaches you, he sets you out to work, and, you, and the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. That's the kind of the idea behind that, and we think it's a great opportunity. We encourage you to be a participant in it. Another thing that's happening is Pastor Sam is, is leading us in doing um, encouragement. We, we don't want to call it counseling per se, but more of an encouragement. People struggle constantly. People talk to you about their problems, and you need to be able to speak Scripture into their lives. You need to be able to open the Word of God and say, look, the Scripture is relevant to this situation. What's going on in your life? God speaks to that. And give them hope, give them comfort, give them encouragement from the Scriptures. And so he's taken several of our members to some biblical counseling training, and he's going to continue doing that. He himself is pursuing uh, ever-growing um, training in, past, or in, in counseling, biblical counseling, to help us. You see, a lot of what Pastor Sam does is kind of behind the scenes. You don't see him up in the pulpit that often. Why? Because he is doing a lot of the personal one-on-one -on -one ministry of the Word. I do a lot of the public ministry of the Word. Pastor Christian does a lot of public ministry of the Word. Pastor Sam does a lot of private ministry of the Word, the one-on-one, -on -one, the marriage uh, counseling and stuff like that. And so those are both absolutely essential for our continued growth. But he wants to train more of you so that you can speak relevantly the Scripture into people's lives. And so I'm excited to see how that ministry will continue to develop in the future. Um, so... The next goal was to establish an ongoing internship for pastoral apprentices. You see, a lot of times pastors come out of seminary and their, their minds are full of knowledge. But one of the things that we say regularly in the office downstairs is they didn't teach us this in seminary. <laughs> They didn't prepare us for this in seminary. I mean, you, you have situations, you have questions, you have circumstances that come up in ministry. And you're like, I don't remember ever learning how to deal with this. And, and so we kind of learn on the fly. And what, one of the things that a professor told me once when I was young and getting started was he said, Phil, you will go to probably three or four churches before you're able to go to a church and stay there for a long time. And the reason is because you're going to make leadership mistakes that are non-recoverable. You, you just won't be able to recover from them. And that's proven true. It's proven true. And, and so we, we learn through experience. And so one of the things we want to do is create an apprenticeship program where we take a, a, a seminary student and his wife right out of seminary, bring them in, and train them experientially. So they've gotten trained mentally. Now they need to be trained experientially, hands-on ministry, so that they don't make some of those critical mistakes in the first years of leadership. Um, this is something I'm really excited about doing. We just haven't had the funding to do it yet. And so just be praying that God would increase funding for this ministry because I think it will be valuable. Not only will we be ministering to those young men and their wives, but we have the ability to influence other churches all over the place as we send out these trained men uh, to preach and pastor and lead. And the final 10-year goal was to establish church planting partnerships with Send City Church Plants. So Send Cities were Kansas City and St. Louis that are close to us. And we wanted to partner with a church planter in those cities and be able to send mission teams there, to be able to pray for them, to be able to uh, help them financially if needed. And we have tried to do that. Pastor Sam has worked on that. We just haven't had one materialized. So we're trusting the Lord. Uh, we're going to continue pursuing that. Uh, hopefully by next year we'll have an, a partnership with a church plant where we can continue doing missions in that regard. So strategies. So that's our, that's our kind of like the North Star for us, right? This is make sure we're still on the right path. So what are we going to do practically, tangibly this year to help us accomplish those goals? Number one, we're going to pray. Now, this is something we emphasized this past year. We're going to continue emphasizing it this year. We currently have prayer groups meeting on Tuesday mornings. Pastor John leads a men's prayer group. Pastor uh, Sam leads a Wednesday evening prayer group. We have a ladies' prayer group that meets on Tuesday mornings. Um, the deacons and, and I pray every Sunday morning uh, for the services. We pray for the Lord to open our hearts to hear the word. We pray for, for me to be able to preach it rightly. Uh, I am so thankful for those men and their willingness to come and pray for that specifically. We also have um, prayer uh, walking. This last year we had 20 participants in prayer walking. I want to see more of our church doing this. Now, one of the things that we're going to strive to do this year is we're going to change the way we do prayer walking, and I think you're going to like it more. Instead of going up door to door, knocking on the door, talking to someone cold turkey, what we're going to do is encourage on one Wednesday night, 
a month through the summer. So not on Saturday mornings, but one Wednesday night a month throughout the summer when we don't have normal Wednesday activities. We're going to encourage home groups. We're going to encourage Sunday school classes to come as a group and be given a, a street or two streets to pray for. And what you're going to do is you're going to walk down the street and you're going to stop at every block and you gather up in a circle and you're going to pray over a, of a you're going to have a card with specific things to pray for for the people that live on that block. And you're going to pray. Now, you're not going to circle up in the middle of the street. That would be dangerous. You're going to gather over to the side, and you're going to pray. We're going to pray for God to save this city. We're going to pray for God to awaken this city. These people need Christ. And God is the one who changes hearts. And so we're going to, we're going to work hard in prayer. You realize why prayer is so hard and neglected in the church? It's because the enemy attacks us in prayer. He doesn't want us praying. Because it is through prayer that God works with mighty power. And when we stop praying and we start working in our strength, all of our ministries, all of our activities, all of our programs, they don't do any good because they're not empowered by prayer. It's like trying to drive a car without an engine. You just don't get very far. And so I encourage you to be a participant in prayer. You know where I learned how to pray? It was by being a part of a prayer group. You go and you pray with other believers. You learn how to pray because you hear how they pray. You hear them interacting with the Lord, and it's, it's helpful. It's, it's, it's encouraging. It's instructive. I encourage you to do that. One other thing we started initially at the beginning of 2016 that kind of stopped, but we've started it up again, and I want this year to be more of a priority is on Sunday evenings we pray. We take a time in the Sunday evening service to pray for lost people by name. So the group that comes on Sunday nights, they've compiled a, a list of names of people that live in this area that they think are lost, and we just pray for those people to be saved. We pray for them by name every Sunday night for God to save them. And we're going to keep doing that. And that's going to be awesome when God begins to start saving those people. It's going to be fantastic. So thus, some of the strategies of prayer that we're going to engage this year. I want to encourage you to keep telling the gospel. You see, we have to keep inviting people to church and we have to keep telling them the gospel. Now, I'm not going to ask you to go online and report your conversations or your invitations. I'm going to trust that you're going to do that. People get saved when they hear the gospel. They get saved when they hear the gospel. Faith is born in the heart when they hear the gospel. They cannot believe if they haven't heard and they cannot hear without someone telling them. Every day you should pray, God, give me an opportunity to tell the gospel today. God, give me an opportunity to invite someone to church today. Will you commit to doing that? Now, don't beat yourself up if a day goes by and you didn't share the gospel with somebody and live in guilt. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I am saying make it a habit that you're constantly asking people to come to church. Now, at first, I'm not an extrovert. I'm an introvert, which you may think that's strange as a pastor. It's, believe me, it makes me nervous. But by God's strength, I'm able to do it. So talking to people, you can ask my wife. I don't like going to parties and things like that. It makes me very nervous, especially if she's not there. And so... Talking to people is hard for me, but I have, I have tried to make it a habit to when I am checking out at Walmart, when I'm sitting in the cell phone store, that's like the DMV, it takes forever in a day. You're sitting there with a captive audience. Just ask them, do you go to church anywhere? They might tell you this place or that. They say, oh man, I just, I just want to invite you to our church. I'm having a great time there. God's really blessed me. I'm growing you know, don't lie. Hopefully those things are happening to you. <laughs> Hopefully you love your church and you invite people to your church. Or the, the pageant this weekend. God has blessed us with a tremendous gift in Pastor John. The man is able to write these dramas that are not only immensely enjoyable and done really well, but they're always so clear with the gospel. And, and the opportunity to invite this community to this event in a very non-threatening way, they're going to hear the gospel. And they're going to be called to repent and believe. I promise you that. This is a tremendous opportunity to, do, to use this evangelistic event to do a great thing. I mean, when we did the Fall Family Festival, we were telling the gospel to hundreds of people. That's what we want to do because that's how people get saved. And so I just encourage you to make gospel telling and invitations to church a habit. Start by just inviting people to church. Start by saying, you know what? I'm going to strive to invite someone to church every day this week. I'm just going to, whether at work or going through the line at Walmart or whatever, I'm just going to say, hey, 
you have a church home, I'd love to invite you to my church. Sometimes they won't come, but sometimes they will. And they're going to hear the gospel. So let's make that a priority in our lives. Something else we want to emphasize this year is personal discipleship plans. I told you what those were just a few minutes ago, and I want to encourage you, take advantage of that. Men, I want to challenge you to take it. Most of the women, most of the ones that are doing the personal discipleship plan are women. Men, let's be intentional about growing. We are called to lead our families. We are called to train our families. How can we lead and train them if we are not growing ourselves? So I just want to encourage you to to make your pursuit of God as intentional as you can. I encourage you to to set up a time to sit down. One of my hopes this year, you can pray for me to have the time and the discipline to do this, but I want to write a short book on personal discipleship. I want to be able to give it to you so that you have a resource that will instruct you how to pursue the Lord intentionally and motivate you to pursue the Lord intentionally in this way. A fourth goal, or a fourth strategy, rather, of this year, of 2017, is to re-emphasize the significance of the ordinances, baptism and Lord's Supper. Baptism and Lord's Supper sometimes just kind of get tacked on to the services. It's just an addendum to what we're doing. I don't want it to be that way. I want it to be highly significant. So the pastors are going to study the ordinances this year in order to make them as meaningful as we possibly can. We want to understand the ordinances so that we can lead you in celebrating the ordinances with as much meaning and significance as we can possibly do. One of the ways that we're going to strive to do that is, you know, we already have established a communion Sunday where we have one service where the whole church comes together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to celebrate our salvation. Now, in the last couple, we've kind of went really long, and so we, we understand that. We're trying to rein that in a little bit so that it's not taxing on you, but we do want to make it very succinct and very uh, powerful, but we also want to include baptism in on that celebration day because a lot of times, the first service, they never get to see a baptism. Most of our baptisms happen in this service. So a lot of those brothers and sisters never get to celebrate like you do when someone is baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so what we would like to do is encourage all people that are going to get baptized to choose one of those four Sundays to be baptized on. Now, we're not going to force it. I mean, if one of those days just won't work, we're still going to baptize you at some point. But we really want to encourage you to be baptized on those days so that we can celebrate together as a church family, so that we can rejoice in that together. Uh, So that's something that's going to be happening in the future. We're also going to continue to make membership meaningful. Membership matters. Membership matters because membership is a commitment to one another. It's like a commitment to marriage. For better or for worse, I'm committed to you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to support you. I'm here for you. There's accountability. I want to encourage you to do that. Do not be a a Christian on an island, but, but, but be a part of a family. Um, We see this as a pattern in the New Testament, and we want to be faithful to that. We're going to continue trying to recover absent members. We have lots of members that don't come. They haven't come for years. And our 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 desire is to go and reclaim them and find out what's going on in their lives. And some of them won't be reclaimed, and we will remove them from our roles because they don't want to be a part of us. But some of them can be reclaimed, and we want to do that. We want to encourage them to come back and to be a part of the church family. We want to emphasize membership by having membership days. On the the Lord's Supper baptism days, following the service, we want to have a luncheon where you can come. If you're thinking about membership, you have questions about membership, um, you can come, and some of the pastors will be there. We'll eat lunch together. We'll answer your questions. We'll share what membership is, why membership is important. We'll share the expectations of a membership, of a member. You'll hear what you will, you know, the benefits of being a member. So all of that to help you with that. But one of the things that we're going to emphasize or institute this year to help us make membership matter is by creating a next step ministry. So out in this main lobby out here, we're going to have a place where you can go. So if you're thinking about, you know, I I, I really think I need to, to be baptized, but I don't know what the next step is. I don't know what to do in order to get myself baptized. We're going to have a next step ministry where it's trained volunteers to encourage you uh, and to give you guidance on what the next step for you is. The very next step, uh, what you need to do first, then next, in order to move yourself from here to there. Now, that may be next step for baptism, maybe next step for membership, maybe next step for service in the church. You want to get involved, you want to serve, but you don't know 
how. You don't know how to connect. You don't know how to get involved. You don't know how to volunteer. Next Step Ministries will be a place where you can just simply go, I want to serve, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get connected. Well, let me share with you the next step. Uh, it can be, I want to go on a mission trip, but I don't, I don't really know what's involved or what I need to do. Go to the Next Step Ministries. And so this, this will be a place where we, we hope that people will get more involved and connected because it's a non-threatening place to go, staffed by trained volunteers uh, that can encourage them in the next step. So that's how we want to make membership significant this year. And then we want to send more members on mission. We want to send more of you on a mission trip. This year we had seven individuals go plus, our, our, I think, three of our pastors. So this next year, I would love to be able to stand up here and say, 25 people that have never been on a mission trip went on a mission trip this year. Whether it's a disaster relief trip, whether it's an international trip, whether it's a trip to one of our sin cities, the 25 of our people that have never been on a mission trip have gone on a mission trip. Now, we've have, we have worked hard. Pastor Sam has worked hard to, to streamline missions involvement. If you are willing, here's how, here's how it works. Everyone that's going to go on an international trip, it'll cost you $1,000. And then the church family will cover the rest of the expenses uh, through the membership offering or the mission offering that we've instituted in September every year. And you will get to go to India. You can go to Uganda and minister in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be changed. You will be changed in ways you've never experienced. And when you come back here, you will be changed. You'll be a more effective ministry here once you go there. And, and see the lostness of the world and see the need of the world. I want to encourage some of you to use your retirement and not waste it. You know, disaster relief is a very difficult ministry for people that work regularly to get involved in because it's just such late notice. You get a few days notice to go. Uh, sometimes more, but not often. And so if you're retired, this is a tremendous opportunity to say, you know what, I'm going to be committed to be a part of that team. So when we're called out, I can go. That team works harder than any other mission trip team I've ever been a part of. Doing mud outs, chainsaw, dragging limbs, it's hard work. But when you do that, when you love those people who are in desperate need, their hearts are open to hearing the gospel. It's a tremendous opportunity, and more of us need to be involved in that. Be willing to take a family vacation and do a mission trip together. Be willing to use your retirement as an opportunity to, to missions. I had a lady in the first service as she left. She said, I've got 13 more days until I'm retired, and then I'm going to be able to get more involved. I'm so excited. That's awesome. She's not thinking of retirement means I get to go sit at home and crochet. I get to go and do ministry like I've never done it before. And that's awesome. And that's what I want more of you thinking like. So, this is kind of where we are, and this is where we're headed as a church. I want to encourage you to pray for us as a church, to pray for us as pastors, to lead rightly, to pray that God would use us to make a huge impact, not only in Macon, but in Missouri and around the world. Now, one of the, other, the last things I want to share with you this morning before we go, if you got one of these when you came in, and you need to pull it out and look at it for just a moment, if you did not get one of these folders from one of the ushers, raise your hand and they will get you one. Okay, if you didn't get one, you need one, so raise your hand and they will get you one. The, the, the first three pages of it is a lot of the stuff that I told you already. So just giving you some statistics of where we are. But on the back page, you're going to see our stewardship plan for 2017. You're going to see our budget. Uh, this is where we were at the top of the page is where we were last year. Uh, you can see that um, we're spending less than uh, we're taking in, which is a healthy sign. We're at 95.8% of our budget, which means that we have given 95.8% of what we budgeted already. That, that's a phenomenal. Uh, in, in the past, previous years, we've been in, in the mid-80s. We're at 98%. We've been in the mid-90s for several, several months. So it's a healthy trend. I'm so proud of the way that you are giving. Because you give, we're able to do ministry unlike we've ever done before. We're able to send missionaries all over the world because you give. Because you give, we have viable, healthy children and student programs. Because you give, we have in residence a full-time 
pastoral biblical counselor and Pastor Sam, where people can come and have that private ministry of the word and, and have devoted time to that. Because you give, we have Pastor John, who is able to perform, do these huge, beautiful pageants as evangelistic events. Those kinds of things wouldn't happen if you were not faithful to give. And so I just want to commend you for what you're doing and thank you for that and challenge you to keep giving. So tonight, uh, we're going to have a family meeting at 6 p.m. where you can ask any question you would like of this stewardship plan. We're not going to take questions right now from the floor, but if you have questions, I want you to go home, look it over. If you have questions, come back tonight at 6. Next Sunday morning, we will vote on this stewardship plan, on this budget. Uh, but you can see the, the dollars there. You can see the different areas of ministry in which we're going to be spending these money. Now, I want to encourage you about something. You see at the top right of that page a giving ladder. Where are you at on that giving ladder? Many, some of us are never giving. And so this year, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to just become an occasional giver. If you never give, then just give every once in a while. Just give every once in a while. If you're an occasional giver now, I want to encourage you to become a consistent giver. Maybe with your paychecks, you're going to give X amount of dollars. You set the amount. You're just going to be consistent in your giving. If you're a consistent giver now, I want to challenge you to step up one more rung and become a tither. Give 10% of your income back to the Lord as an act of faith, as an act of devotion to Him, trusting in Him to provide for you. If you're a tither now, I want to encourage you to do something. I want to encourage you to be a sacrificial giver. Give above and beyond that 10% so that more ministry can be done. Do you realize that as we give together, we're Southern Baptists, which means we give 5% of our budget goes to the cooperative program. And the cooperative program monies goes all over the world. It goes to establish and sustain the six seminaries that we have to train pastors and missionaries. It goes to support international missionaries over, I think it's around 5,000, right, Sam? International missionaries all over the world, in places we can't even name or we can't tell you their names because of security reasons, where they're telling the gospel where it's never been heard. Pastors are being trained all over the world through the IMB. It is, it is because you give we're able to support church planners all over North America in order that more people hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of that is through this cooperative program, through this giving. So the more we give as a church, the more we're able to send on and do more ministry in that regard. It's just something to think about, something to pray about uh, as a family. So, with that said, I'm excited about the future of making First Baptist Church. I'm excited about what God is doing in us. I'm excited about where God is leading us. I'm excited to walk with you, following the Lord for His glory and our good. Now, if you're here this morning and you're, and you're not a believer, maybe this is a, you just happen to wander in. This is not normal. Normally, we open up God's Word and I explain it and apply it to your life. So come back and, and hear God's Word because that's infinitely more significant than hearing me talk about this kind of stuff. But this is necessary. But if this is your first time and, and you're not sure about this Christianity thing, I want, you to understand, I want you to understand four things. God made you. God made everything. He made everything good in the world. Everything belongs to God because God made everything, which means God has the right to tell us how he wants us to live. But number two, man is a sinner. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Everyone's a sinner because the Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all disobeyed God, and the consequence for sin is death, not just physical death, but eternal death as well. There's only one way sin is paid for. It's through death. Either you die or someone dies in your place. And that's number three. Christ is our Savior. He's our rescuer who died in our place. He came, he lived a sinless, perfect life in order that he might die as your substitute and mine so that we could be forgiven of our sins. But not only did he die in substitution for us, he gave us his perfect record of obedience. He just gives it to us as if it belongs to us. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see our striving to be obedient he sees perfect obedience and he accepts us because of what christ has already done and the bible says that if number four you repent and believe you repent and you trust in christ you repent you turn away from your sin you say i don't want that i want christ and you depend on christ to make you right with god he will save you right now today if you have not trusted in christ why do you wait there's salvation in no other name 
but Christ. And church member, I challenge you this morning. Let's commit to being faithful to the Great Commission, to making disciples. Let's work together for the glory of our God and for the salvation of the nations. Let's pray.